Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Cremando for Yoga U Online, and I'm here today with Catlin Robinson. Catlin is a certified yoga therapist, a very experienced yoga teacher, and she's been practicing yoga and mindfulness techniques for about 20 years, in fact, more than 20 years. Catlin specializes in yoga for mental health and women's wellness, which includes uh, anxiety for teenagers and exhaustion and adults and for women's issues, that's mother care, that's perimenopause, that's fertility, which is something we're gonna to be touching on today. Catlin offers advanced professional training and mentorships for yoga teachers and mental health professionals, helping the mental health community bringing yoga practices and philosophy to their clients. Her focus is on teaching the richer inner teachings and traditions of yoga to reduce stress enrich people's lives and promote healing at the deepest level of self. And that makes for a very good conversation because I'd like to talk to you, Catelyn. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank I'd you. like to talk to you about the intersection of two of those topics and, and that is infertility or fertility issues and stress because I know they are intimately connected. Now, Infertility or fertility, people who are, are trying to, are struggling with fertility issues, I think oftentimes there's a feeling of being alone. We don't talk about it a lot in the yoga community, but I think we don't talk about it a lot in the world at large. So people who are going through fertility struggles, I've known people going through fertility struggles who keep their suffering to themselves, who think they're other than, who think they've failed, who feel inadequate, who have all kinds of other things going on uh, that get brought into that bundle of struggling with fertility issues. Now, I want to talk to you about this as a yoga therapist and a yoga teacher and a mental health professional, but I really want to talk to you about this as someone who's gone through that process. So could we start with your story, what you're comfortable sharing? Because I know that this topic is very near and dear to your heart. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm very happy to share um, to your point, knowing other people's stories, knowing that they've gone through it helps to normalize and hopefully create a community or an understanding that there is a community, which, and, and, it's, and it's a very big part of what I offer um, to my clients is, is just knowing that they're not alone. So um, my journey with um, into motherhood started um, when I was, just before I turned 32, I did, was when I decided I wanted to have kids. And it's, uh, you know, you, you make that decision and you figure, you start planning your life. Okay, so I'll, I'll get pregnant, you know, in the next couple months, and then I'm gonna um, have a baby and um, et cetera, et cetera. And so then the months go on and on and on, and it's not happening. And so, for about six months, it was just, you know, business as usual thinking like you do, where we're kind of raised to believe that you, you want to have, you, you want to get pregnant and, and you just do, it just happens because that's what happens, right? Um, and what, so at, at six months, went to see my doctor and got some suggestions for tracking my cycle and, uh, was and, and then an, another six months went by we started working with uh, still nothing and started working with some medical inter interventions getting um, some medication to help manage uh, my cycle and, and promote ovulation and it was another 18 months of um, what I call kind of the wormhole of of medicalized fertility, trying to get a diagnosis, trying to um, try different interventions that weren't um, really invasive. So like IVF, which is the, the most common. And after 18 months, we did get a diagnosis and we're told that there was about, based on what was going on, um, 
there was about a one in a million chance that we would get pregnant um, naturally. So we had a close family, we had close family members that had gone through um, the process of artificial reproductive technology, what I like to call kind of medicalized fertility. And over the course of 10 years and hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, we're not able to get pregnant and, and ended up adopting. So we, we decided very, we were, I, I, I think in some ways lucky that we decided very quickly that we didn't want to go that route. Um, not that there's any, I have no judgment or, uh, you know, I think IVF is great and I don't have any judgment over um, medicalized fertility treatments at all. They, they can, they can be very, exactly what some couples need, but it wasn't for us. And so we started to look into adoption, which is a whole nother kind of realm of stress. Um, it's, it's, it's not straightforward by any chance uh, where we are, I think, anywhere in the West. Um, and decided that we were going to go with an international adoption agency. That process took, I, at this point, I don't even remember, but I want to say a year to get all of the paperwork done and the police checks and the every, everything else. And was just like extraordinarily expensive, just the, the process, let alone the actual bringing um, this baby home. Um, and all through it, you know, all through this adoption process, and it's funny how our mind works, there was still in the back of my mind, maybe this month, maybe this month, maybe we'll be the one in a million, maybe we'll win the lottery. And I continued to track my cycles and continued to try to manage our sex life so that we were having sex at the right time which it creates a whole kind of dimension of stress on the intimacy and connection that you have with your partner. Um, and, you know, I, I, I in the beginning, like I, there, I, there was so much grief and so much depression that um, I had been practicing yoga, um, but I really kind of let it go as we do when we fall into these deep depressions, the things that we know support us still just seem so, it's, it's just hard to get your stuff together to, to help yourself in any way. But I did pick up yoga again, really dedicated myself, decided that that was something that I was gonna help me feel fulfilled on other levels. You know, giving me something outside of, just this constant thinking about getting pregnant and thinking of parenthood as how I was going to define myself. So anyways, yoga was extraordinarily helpful and really helped me to um, navigate the grief, helped me to go deep inside myself and figure out who I was outside of this need to, to be a mother and really this you know, in some ways, this kind of loss of identity, because we're told that we can, like I said, we're told that we can get pregnant. That's what we're led to believe from the time we're tiny little girls, right? It's like, from the time you're given your first baby doll, it's, it's like, not just that, it's not just the instinct that's being cultivated, but it's just the assumption. And that um, part of being a woman is being is becoming a mother and being pregnant in particular, right? So um, I started, the, the yoga really started to allow me to create space around that and, and get perspective on what it was to be a mother, who I was outside of motherhood. And about four months after we finished all of the paperwork for uh, the initial paperwork for our adoption, it was still at that time going to be eight years before 
we were um, mm. matched with with a child. Um, so about four months after that, I did get pregnant, and you were the one in a million. Yeah, and I just I really like I there's so there's two things that I like to say, and the first is that that's not setting expectations for other people because I never want to say like, just go to, to a plan B and all of a sudden you're going to get pregnant because they, that, I, that isn't the reality for everybody. But I think the part of my story that I feel is so important to share is just that surrender. First of all, having a plan outside of preg pregnancy, finding a space where you can just really surrender to whatever's going to happen and uh, a space for allowing um, whatever to happen to happen. And uh, also space where you can just step outside that the, the stress that we put on ourselves for something to happen. So, and whether... I got pregnant or not, that stress was minimized, right? And and so that it I, it didn't feel the pressure that um, that I had been putting on myself for you know four four years before. Mm -hmm. It was just this in, incredibly intense pressure to to get pregnant, and it was always in the back of my mind. And it's like no matter how much. I said, yeah, we're going to adopt and everything's going to be great. And it was still, but, but, but maybe, but maybe. And literally as soon as that, but maybe turned off, that's when I got pregnant. So, um, and you know, there's something, that, something that you said that is, I think is so important, um, is that you needed to detach the outcome of whether or not you are going to end up being a mother in one way or another from the process of how you were talking to yourself and the process of how you were nurturing and taking care of yourself. And I think you've really touched on the people that I've known that have struggled with fertility issues. That point about you have to have sex when they tell you it's on the calendar and no matter where you are and whether it's a good day or a bad day or whether you're at your parents' house or wherever you are, that's where you have to have the sex. And it kind of takes, you know, the things that we like to cultivate about having a, a, a loving relationship and having things be organic and natural. It, it's a very, in some ways, it's so artificially becomes the the dictator of what's going on in your life that yeah. that process no matter how you get to the outcome that process before that surrender moment has got to be so fraught and so difficult it's incredibly complex cycle of grief right so one of the things just to back up for a second you said like no matter where you are you need to kind of stop, drop and have sex. But what I find happens more than anything is your whole life revolves around, I can't do anything on this day because it's sex day. <laughs> right? Which is, it, you know, is really not intimate. There's no connection. It's so prescribed, right? And then when we think about, um, IVF and medicalized treatment where it's that's all just completely taken out and you know or artificial hormones flowing through you which kind of zaps any feeling of sensuality the catch-22 is one of the best things that we can do to manage stress is to cultivate um, nurturing and loving relationships and who are we best to cultivate a nurturing and loving relationship with it's our spouse right and even if um you're in a non-traditional relationship that bonding with your partner doesn't even have to include sex right in some ways it's like d d like maybe it shouldn't include sex but mm -hmm. just feeling intimate and like loved by um your partner is uh so helpful 
Mm-hmm. And of course, I've also known single moms going through um, infertility, right? Maybe they don't have a partner. Same thing. They'll find some way that you can be really loving and that will help to counter that process that is so mechanical, right? Mm-hmm. So, so opposite to, um, to the loving and nurturing relationships that we, we need both to procreate and to reduce stress. So, so you, you do a lot of work with stress in your business with people who have, who have anxiety, people who are not trying to get pregnant. You just, stress is one of the topics you work with, with your clients as a yoga therapist, but this kind of stress, this kind of, I'm going through fertility treatment or I'm going through the adoption process, um, is its own special kind of stress. And it's going on while you still have to show up for work, take care of your aging parents, uh, pay your bills. It's its 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 own special kind of stress. Yeah, so this complex, if, if you're trying to get pregnant um, naturally, right? Following your cycles then, and, and even if you're not, right? Like for me, when I was uh, adopting, it's this, it's this cycle of hope, 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 then plan out the sex, then wait, 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 then devastating grief, oh. right? Devastating grief. And every month, every single month. And so one of the stats that really hit home for me when I thought about this connection, this intersection between trauma and stress and infertility is that there's a Harvard study that showed that infertility was as stressful, if not more stressful than a diagnosis of uh, diabetes, HIV, and cancer. And so you can imagine what it's like being diagnosed, that devastating diagnosis of cancer every 28 days or so, Mm -hmm. right? And then, oh, maybe, maybe I'm in recovery. Maybe it's gone away. Maybe I don't have the cancer anymore. No, 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 Mm -hmm. still have the cancer, right? But we don't, like in our culture, we don't recognize infertility as that, right? We, yeah. don't, we don't even, we don't even talk about it. It's like, don't say anything because, you know, from people outside, don't say anything because they might be having a struggle or we're not sure if they actually want to get pregnant or it's not really that big a deal. There's so many other ways that you can get pregnant, you know, and silly things that people say like oh you know imagine what their life would be like if you don't have kids you'd be able to travel more yeah and it's all the best scenario and but in the meantime they have kids yeah it's all meaning but that's just so um diminishing of this incredible grief that people are having so that's you know it's the cycle that's that's complicated and and creates this cycle. It's the reactions that people have that create the cycles. It's the mind games that we play with ourselves around maybe, maybe, maybe no. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's no question I've I've suffered um, devastating loss in my life and fertility was harder because it's just this nonstop bombardment of stress there's no opportunity to recover from the grief right so in other devastating losses grief has a process and Mm -hmm. we're able to um you know provided we're grieving properly we're we're, we do you do you do have a reconciliation with that loss Mm -hmm. but when it's continuous there's no um well and also when you have a when you when you suffer a loss out loud people send you flowers they bring casserole you open the door and there's a ham or if you're from the midwest or there's a you know tofu salad if you're a yogi uh but people share that with you and i think one of the problems for people with inter- infertility issues is they're going through that privately and their community is not either able to or privy to the news that they should be, you know, taking care, taking a different kind of care yeah. um, with, yeah. with those individuals. Because a lot of, I, I think there is a lot of shame around that girls are oftentimes raised to assume they will be married with children. and. Um, 
that if they're not, there's a reason. What's the reason? What happened? Yeah, what's wrong <laughs> with them, right? What's yeah, them? And, and the thing that you're describing for some people is never going to end because they're not going to end up having children in the end. Their, their story will not end up like yours did. So that's another kind of a, an unknown that you're dealing with. So let's now talk about your other ex, uh, uh, field of expertise, which is managing stress. So how can yoga come into this really fraught picture and offer support, not just by the way to the woman, but also to the man? Yeah. And to the family and to the, all of the people in the in the loop trying to make this thing happen. Yeah. Yeah, because also secondary infertility is 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 definitely um, a reality, right? So people who have children and want to have um, more more children and aren't able to, so then it's the whole family. But the style of yoga I teach is definitely a feminine style, but that isn't to say there isn't a ton of value for men. So when I first started studying yoga for fertility, it was very much about how do we make the body um, ready for conception. And so I had this epiphany around stress and trauma and really started to focus on the stress piece because not only is, uh, you know, does it create stress, but stress actually does things to our body systems that makes it harder to get pregnant. So super important to manage the stress. There's tons of studies that say yoga is really unique in its ability to manage stress because it's the only discipline that works on mind, body, and spirit, and stress intersects mind, body, and spirit. You know, from, from the body perspective, um, then we, we know that breath is key to regulating the nervous system, so working on proper, effective, and comfortable, soothing breath. Um, it has the ability to work on the, uh, the other physio physiology, the muscles and, um, release tension in the muscles. When we release tension in the muscle, it has an effect on the nervous system. And both of those two things have a direct impact on what's happening in the mind. So psychotherapy can be very, very helpful, but it really is heavily focused on the thinking mind and emotions, right? but it, it kind of misses the yoga piece right and then there is um, there are other uh, fertility treatments and and stress uh, treatments like exercise that help work on the body they don't really ha have as much of an impact on the mind so I mean that is the beauty of yoga we can touch in in one practice we touch all levels of the being and then of course the the spiritual and emotional and spiritual mm -hmm. and emotional support that just being with yourself can you know working on uh rela deep relaxation reconnection with uh who you are so I believe wholeheartedly that yoga is, has, because of that intersection between infertility and stress, yoga has this really unique ability to support mm -hmm. people. Um, yeah, from what you said that the cognitive reframing is a, it's, it's a yoga practice, uh, acceptance. And yoga, of course, has wonderful practices for dealing with grief and, I think there's oftentimes people mistake other emotions for grief in that process, that there is just a profound grief at the heart of everything. And uh, yoga can be very helpful. Yes, uh, absolutely. Right. So we're talking about stress and the kind of the conception part, but then on the emotional level, there's this whole other piece, like, like we said before, fertility is so uh, complicated and, and there's so much going on. Um, and so with one practice, we can support people th through it all, mm -hmm. right? 
and then so you know like I said so much of my practices is really are it's really geared towards women that it's 90 percent 99 percent of the people that I work with are women but the you know it can absolutely be translated towards men and men's stress like we have to recognize if you're in a traditional relationship the men are 50 percent and so managing mm -hmm. their stress is and 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 they're grieving as well but you know everything that's coming up for women is coming up for men as well so um as many of the practices as the man feels comfortable with you know mm -hmm. breath deep relaxation meditation mm -hmm. some of the um muscle all the deeper practices it sounds like are yeah. the ones that are going to be the most helpful also it seems to me as you're talking that a woman who's working with someone like you and learning how to do better self-care and and self-regulation will go home to a partner in a better state to be in a relationship and so even, even a partner who doesn't come to yoga is going to benefit from the yoga yeah. because they're going to be with someone who's in a better mental and emotional state. Yeah. And I certainly have practices that are specifically meant to make women feel sensual, right? And what so an important point. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, just exactly to what you're saying, right? It's not just about going home and feeling, you know, going home and feeling relaxed, but we want to create that connection as well and revive some sense of sensuality between the couples because it can help with conception and because it helps with stress and it's just important in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of different um, ways that we can bring that out right make you feel so alive again and want to go home and create those connections so nice. it's a great practice to use around ovulation as well so that you know if, if it's that if it's that time of the month where it's you know go time for sex then having a practice a ritual around getting ready for that that includes some yoga practices and some meditations that can cultivate that sense of feeling alive and receptive and um, sensual how how perfect right how wonderful to and what a gift to be able to bring that into um, the relationship and the process of conceiving yeah. Well, I'm sure there are people watching us right now who are saying, where do I sign up? Um, because this is what I need. I'm struggling. I'm suffering. And uh, I want to be a parent. It, and I realize it may or may not happen. You are teaching a class for us in the next, in the near future. Can you talk, can you tell us a little bit about that class and what kind of uh, things we'd be doing in your in your course right yeah yeah i'm really excited um for the course to to come out and it's it you know there's a piece on stress so more information about this connection and why it's so important there's a piece on breath and how we can optimize our breath to reduce stress there's um and then there's just a lot of information about the types of yoga poses and practices that are ideal for cultivating all of these things that we talked about, optimizing um, the body to conceive, releasing deep held tension, um, processing grief, feeling sensual. So um, I, I outline in it, all of the types of poses that are best and then there's a practice as well so right. yeah. you can practice along but my hope is also to give um, everybody who takes the course kind of an a la carte menu of all of the things all of the different poses and practices that are supportive so they can create a practice on their own or if they're new they can go to uh, take other group yoga classes and know which ones that they should, they should avoid and yeah 
and it's about and and it's also broken down by the times of the month so what's the best what are the best practices um when you're menstruating what are the best practices when you're pre-ovulation when you're ovulation and then when you're in the luteal phase so we um so lots of practical information and also a little bit of a sangha, a little bit of comfort in knowing, you know, everyone on this call is dealing with this issue. Yeah. Either as a therapist or a teacher or as someone who is working with their fertility issues. So, so just, you're not alone. Yeah. And in a really positive environment, right? Like I think I really try to create positivity. So there's so much negativity and um, uh, heaviness around it and having a community where we can just lift lift ourselves up, lift, our, lift up the circle in, um, in a collective. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of mental health as well that yoga offers, right? It's just finding finding the positive and I'm not saying finding the positive in the infertility struggle, but elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, finding that one thing isn't going well, but there may be a lot of other wonderful things going on in your life that you have stopped looking at because you're just looking at that one exactly. glaring thing. Yeah, exactly what I did with yoga, right? When I said, I, <clears throat> I had kind of given up everything and, and fallen into this cycle of, of depression. Yeah. And so the yoga gave me that, but the other thing that it can give is maybe yoga doesn't match people the way it did for me, but can just be a supportive practice so that they mm -hmm. can find the other spaces. of. Positive. And there are so many practices that, as you say, a la carte, maybe you don't resonate with the poses, but you would resonate with some of the meditation or some of the breath work. There's something that you could resonate with or will resonate within you to help you. But yeah. um, that, that feeling of inadequacy or loss of power, if you have these tools and it's a la carte, you're empowering people to choose the things that will bring them comfort yeah and that's huge right in in terms of managing stress and just in general making sure that we can create a practice that everybody's going to um love doing because if you yeah. don't love doing it then you don't you don't have a tendency of doing it right so yeah, yeah so it's like here's a kind of category of poses that work really well for this and here are some a bunch of examples choose the ones that you like the best. And mm -hmm. um, those are the ones that you should be practicing. Well, Callan, as someone who has some very close people in my life who've gone through this, I wanna thank you for your work. Yeah, my God. Uh, and thank you for talking with us. And I'm looking forward to your course. Yeah, yes, I hope, I hope uh, we have lots of people join, create, and like you say, a Sangha. Yeah, thanks so much. And I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care.